Hello again, I'm Ruth and today I'm going to be talking about five adaptations of Little Women, Louisa May Alcott's American coming of age novel. And I was about 13 when I first read it, so similar age to Beth really. And I read it in the two volumes it was originally published in. So in 1868 there was Little Women and then in 1869 there was Good Wives. And I discovered these books at a similar time to when I discovered the Anne of Green Gables series, which is also American and about a very unconventional girl, kind of like Jo. I think the sisters in Daniel Deronda, Hans Merrick's sisters, are also very similar. They have a really loving relationship with their mother. They're starting to use their talents like drawing to try and draw in money. So I think the four March sisters are kind of similar in a way. They've got a really nice relationship with each other and they have very different talents as well. They're almost like four different personality types because they're such different people. So that means that as you read it, you will probably relate to at least one of the characters. I think it's really funny in Downton Abbey when Lady Grantham says that she thinks having daughters was going to be like little women, but instead they're at each other's throats all the time. And in Little Women, they are at each other's throats. Jo literally attacks Amy when she burns her book. So it's almost like she hasn't read Little Women properly. But I think Little Women is very much about home life, domestic life. You get really fond of the characters. They all have foibles. It's very much a satire on human nature and how people get irritated in their daily lives. And it's kind of very much a moral tale of how to be content with your lot because the March sisters are always complaining because they're quite poor at the moment and their father is away in the Civil War of America. But actually for them, they're not having to struggle so much as a lot of people in America were at the time. I think Meg struggles a lot because she can remember when the family was richer. The father is away so they've not got their father figure and they're very much reliant on their mother. So as you read the novel, it's actually quite sermonising sometimes and a little bit cheesy. I think it's partly because it is based on Pilgrim's Progress. A lot of the chapters have influence from the places in Pilgrim's Progress, which is a Christian allegory. It can be very moralistic, but overall it's a very sweet novel that you can read. You sort of grow to love the characters. In Good Wives, it's three years later when they become adults, but Little Women is very much them when they're teenagers, when they're sort of growing up. They don't really want to grow up. They want to stay in the lovely world that they're in with their mother, but instead they're having to slowly work out how to make a living and how to be content with their lives, even though they're not as rich, their talents aren't taking them to the places they want them to take them. So today I'm going to be talking about the 1933 version, which is black and white, the 1949 MGM version, the 1994 Columbia Pictures version, the 2017 BBC version, and the 2019 version directed by Greta Gerwig. So here we go. Jo is the second eldest March sister in Little Women, and she has a very hot temper. Her Pilgrim's Progress chapter is called Jo Meets Apollyon. Apollyon is a demonic dragon from Pilgrim's Progress, so she is struggling a lot with how angry she gets and how easily frustrated and she gets frustrated a lot because she does not fit into society the role for women at the time is very much against how she feels and thinks and wants to be she is most inspired by louisa may alcott herself who was writing a lot based on her and her own sisters obviously louisa may alcott became a successful writer and that's what joe wants to be i think she is most true to the book in the 2017 version because Maya Hawke plays it very well. She is so full of stress all of the time. She finds it very hard to keep down her frustrations because society is very much against how she is in her normal way. She's got a kind of slightly offhand aggressive manner and that is not how women were supposed to be at the time. Women were supposed to be graceful and demure so that's just not how she is in personality and therefore she's coming up against it all the time. She's having to work for Aunt March in the 1933 version at the start. She sort of reads to her and is her companion. Aunt March wants her to be something that she's not, a sort of young lady 
much more like Amy, for instance. Joe likes sliding down the banister in the 1933 version. Unfortunately, they show her as very childlike and immature. It's like she hasn't developed her emotions properly as an adult. So I really don't like that in the 1933 version. When she's crying, it's almost like she's three years old. She's kind of infantilized. And Professor Bear taking her out is kind of like taking a child out for day trips. And she sort of reacts to it like a child would, very overexcited. And you see how sort of immature and undeveloped she is. Whereas in the 1949 version, which is very much inspired by the 1933 version, like Laurie chasing Joe in the woods, those sort of scenes. But the actual character of Jo is much more mature. You first see her when she is sort of acting out the Christmas play, preparing for the Christmas play with the other girls. And she strokes her moustache and has a great adventurous spirit and is very charismatic. You also see them doing the Christmas play in the 1933 version because up until about half an hour is almost line for line Little Women the book. You even get to see them doing the Christmas play and they're actually quite good because they're coming out of silent films. The black and white version is a very interesting moment in cinema because suddenly they can do sound so they're so used to expressing themselves just through gestures that they're actually very good at the play that they do within the film and Joe very much speaks as if she's doing the stage version of Peter Pan just kind of doing this boyish voice all of the time but I actually really enjoy the little Christmas play that they do in the 1933 version and you get to see a little bit of them acting in the 1994 version Joe is very much into theatre in that version but her tomboyishness feels very put on. Renona Ryder is very conventionally pretty so that doesn't really fit the description of Jo at all who feels very uncomfortable in herself, she's quite lanky, she's sort of growing faster than she is realising but I do find it very funny when she's very angry about John stealing Meg's gloves. Stealing as she sees it, he's really sort of taking it as a love token. But of course, Renona Ryder was a big star, so they were hardly going to turn her down and say, no, you can't play the main character when she was agreeing to be in their film. I particularly don't like how she's portrayed in the 2019 version, because you start off with adult Jo, and she is still as bratty and callous as she was when she was a child. She's portrayed as really rude when she's a child. I think that they think that being a tomboy is just being sort of mean and having no manners. It's like she's copying all the worst traits of masculinity that she sees as being really good. But in the 2019 version, you start off with her in New York, so she's an adult. She takes Friedrich's criticism of her writing very badly. To be fair, it's tactlessly put. But the way she reacts is totally immature. She says, no one will forget Joe March. And it's kind of like she only cares about being famous, just like she did when she was a kid. And I think as she grows up, the reason for her writing changes. She does it because she loves it. She does it because she wants to support Beth. Not just doing it because of the reasons that they had when they were children, when they wanted to be rich and famous, because when you're a teenager, of course, those are the sort of things you want. But as you mature, you sort of work out what life is really about. I think Little Women is very much about working out what life is really about and valuing the real things. So love and true relationships rather than just getting rich, which is very much what Amy and Meg particularly like. So Amy is Meg's pet because they both sort of like the niceties of life. They fit into the way that females are supposed to be at the time, whether Joe and Beth don't. So Beth is Joe's pet and they get on because they both struggle against sort of socialising and the etiquette and being graceful young women for different reasons, but that is why they understand each other very well. And then Joe and Meg get on very well because they're the older ones and even though they have totally different personalities they sort of can remember the good times that the younger two can't. Joe very much doesn't like it when John, 
Laurie's tutor starts getting interested in Meg and that's why she's so angry when he takes her glove because she can see the way the wind's blowing. It's very confusing the fact that they start with the adult versions in the 2019 version. Even though they do slightly different lighting, I think they needed to show better that it is older version and younger version because they flip between the two. Confusing even for someone who knows the story very well. Joe actually says a quote which is from a different character of Louisa May Alcott's from a different book series and that is women they have minds and they have souls as well as just hearts and they've got ambition and they've got talent as well as just beauty. I'm so sick of people saying that love is all a woman is fit for. That it was shown in the trailer and I think that very much shows what this version of Little Women is like. It kind of has this version of feminism which is very much going on rants, kind of stating things that are obvious at this time. So I don't really like it because I think the narrative of Little Women very much shows feminism without sort of throwing it in your face. So much more powerful than just having a go at people because I felt affronted whilst watching it in the cinema and it wasn't even really having a go at me. So it's not even a quote from Little Women, it's a quote from Rose in Bloom, which is also by Louisa May Alcott. But I think just splicing loads of Alcott quotes and sort of presenting Jo as if she is Louisa May Alcott herself by changing the ending. And I think it's kind of a trend. With adaptations of famous books, I think they tend to conflate the main character as being the writer themselves and sort of interweaving both the writer's life events and what happens to their main characters. They do that too much nowadays and it's really irritating. I think it's much better in something like Tess of the D'Urbervilles where the narrative presents the feminist message. The narrative makes you be on the side of Tess because you see how difficult her life is. Show, not tell. So in the 1949 version of Little Women, Meg is played by Jeanette Lee, who I know was in Psycho, the really big horror film by Alfred Hitchcock, and also in The Vikings is where I've seen her. Obviously, I know Emma Watson was in Harry Potter, but I think she plays a sort of similarly vain character in Ballet Shoes. So she's quite well chosen to play Meg. And they show kind of the good wives part of her life as well, which is quite interesting. They don't tend to show her problems after she's married. They show a bit of how difficult it is for her birth in 2017. But in 2019, they show a bit that she still wants luxury and she can't have it. So her friend kind of encourages her to buy some material that she can't afford. John needs a new coat, so she really shouldn't have bought it. And then he's kind of annoyed and she's annoyed at him because he can't buy her all this nice stuff. I quite like that they try and show more of her marriage problems. And it does sort of say in Good Wives how things aren't perfect for her after she gets married. But at the same time, I think them trying not to be judgy and trying to show this sort of traditional feminine role and that it's okay to want marriage and family, they don't really succeed in doing that because Meg doesn't seem to really like her children because she's unhappy with her marriage or at least with how little money they've got. But it's not presenting it very well, it's just showing that she isn't happy as a mother, which I don't think is correct to the book. So Meg is the eldest March girl. Her Pilgrim's Progress chapter is Meg Goes to Vanity Fair. And it's because she kind of wants to be the belle of the ball. She goes to this party and she lets them dress her up like a doll and she actually gets objectified quite a lot. And then they start spreading rumours about her and Laurie. So she starts to see that the world she really craves is not as nice as she thought it was. And in the 1994 version in the dressing room, she has to defend her family's values because they're transcendentalist. And Louisa May Alcott herself, her family were transcendentalist. So they didn't really like the rationalist thinking and the industrialization that was coming in at the time. They were temperance people, they didn't drink. And also they weren't really racist. Her father let a black girl into a school and it had to close down. Their father is with the North, so he's with the Union, he's a chaplain in their army, and they are anti-slavery under Abraham Lincoln. I think you see more of the Civil War most in 2017. You see the soldiers coming back in their uniforms in the 1994 version, 
but that is a very short clip where in the 2017 version there's this really impactful montage to the girls singing Land of the Leal which is basically about Scottish heaven and about death so it's really beautifully done and you see John going to war and getting injured in the fight so I think that's much better because you see the other side of it they're kind of on the home front as women not going to the war and then their father and also John, Meg's fiance at the time, is also actually on the battlefield. And I think it's really nice to see the girls singing whilst Beth is playing the piano. I used to sing whilst my sister played the piano. It's really nice to see that part of the family and how they can come together in that. Beth is the third March sister and she is very shy and loves the piano. She is quite motherly in the 1933 version, so I really like her in that version. But unfortunately, she is played by Margaret O'Brien, who was an MGM child star in the 1949 version. So she was in The Secret Garden and Jane Eyre. So they must have really liked her acting style and thought it was sweet. But I personally find it incredibly annoying. And then in the 1994 version, she seems to cry a lot. She even cries when she gets the piano. So I feel like that's what Claire Danes had to do in her audition, is just prove that she could cry. And then in the 2017 version, you see her crippling social anxiety, how she can't deal with people who aren't in the family, which is why she doesn't go to school. So she finds it really hard to take Mr. Lawrence, Laurie's grandfather, up on his invitation for her to use his piano. But actually, they end up having a really nice friendship. And that is her Pilgrim's Progress chapter, Beth Finds the Palace Beautiful, because she finds out that actually, by being a bit brave, and stepping out of her comfort zone, she can do things she really likes, like play piano. Amy is the youngest March daughter, and she probably is the most opposed to the family's transcendentalist beliefs, because she's quite selfish. She's very open about wanting to marry rich, and she doesn't mind saying how much she likes money. So her Pilgrim's Progress chapter is called Amy's Valley of Humiliation, and she is a schoolgirl, so she has the biggest change in years in a way, even though they all change at the same time, obviously. But she goes from very, very young to an adult, whether the others are already teenagers at the start of the book. So basically, she's a schoolgirl and there are trends at the school. It's limes. We had moshy monsters, these little plastic figurines, but for them, it's pickled limes. And she owes some of the girls pickled limes and she desperately wants some. So Meg gives her some money and then she buys lots of pickled limes. And she's quite smug about having limes. But then she gets humiliated because the teacher actually does corporal punishment. When he finds the limes, he hits her with a ruler and makes her stand in front of the whole class. And it's very, very nasty. It's not something that would be legal nowadays. Her family really stand up for her. And Joe, even though she and Joe clash a lot, Joe is really up in arms against it. And Mommy takes her out of the school and starts having Joe teach her lessons. So she gets homeschooled. I find it a little bit weird that her older sister, who's only like three years older than her, is teaching her her lessons. That's slightly worrying for her education. But since she wants to grow up and just be a wife to a rich man. That doesn't matter so much. She cares a lot about having accomplishments. So she really likes art, and that's something that makes her very interesting to me. In the 2019 version, you see her out painting in plein air outside, and she sees that some of the men are starting to do the Impressionist movement, and she's really disillusioned with her own art, even though it's really good. And she says, I want to be great or nothing, which, I think Amy in the book does say, but she still likes sketching. She still enjoys art. She just realises that she's not a genius and she probably won't be able to make money with her art. I think that's quite different to just completely giving up on art just because she can't be amazing at it and have her work in all the galleries. I don't really agree with that stance. I like to think that I'd still like to draw even if no one else liked my drawings, as long as I liked them and felt that I was improving then I'd still be able to enjoy doing art. But I think it's similar to the way that Joe kind of wants to be the best at writing. And I think that's a really poor message to give to young people, to say that you should only pursue your talents if you're going to be world-renowned. 
They're definitely trying much harder in the 2019 version to make Amy likeable. It's almost like she's the main character rather than Joe. And Joe actually still resents her even when they're grown up. So I think it's really interesting that actually you open on Amy and Amy seeing Laurie again when they're adults. So you're really playing into wanting their love story to work rather than like in the other versions, always starting off with Joe and Laurie and then Amy and Laurie coming kind of out of the blue, especially in the 1994 version where Amy is a younger version. So she's Kirsten Dunst as a child and there's an older version who I appreciate looks like older Kirsten Dunst, like you don't question that there's the same person except for they have a massive personality difference in that the older version is very demure, whether the younger version is quite sparky and sort of wise beyond her years. But I don't really like how they kind of introduce the idea of the romance whilst it's still the child version of Amy. Like Laurie says to her in the carriage that he promises he'll kiss her before she dies. And I think it's supposed to be romantic, but it's kind of just creepy. And also he introduces Fred Vaughan to her while she's still a child version. So therefore it's kind of uncomfortable when later on it's likely that she and Fred Vaughan are going to get engaged. So I think it would have been much better if they'd introduced the older version much earlier in the film, and then you could start with the romance with her and Laurie. It's shown much better in the 2017 version why she and Laurie should be together rather than Joe and Laurie, because Joe and Laurie have an argument when they are driving a carriage and they actually both threaten to get out of it because they're disagreeing so much. So it really proves to you what the book says, which is they're too similar in personality. They've both got hot tempers and they're both very stubborn, so they shouldn't really get married. Whether the reason why Amy and Laurie get on in the 2017 version is because they both realise that they can be better people. And they're both also seeing that their ambitions aren't going to work out in the way they thought they did. And unlike in the 2019 version, they're sort of seeing it quite maturely. They are seeing a realistic version of how their life is going to be. So Laurie similarly realises that he's not going to be a great composer, just like Amy knows that she's not going to be great at art because in Europe she sees the great artists and realises she's never going to be like them. But that doesn't put her down in quite the same way. Amy is very fun in the 1949 version, played by Elizabeth Taylor, who is very clearly wearing a blonde wig the whole time, is very obvious. You also get a little bit of her liking Laurie more than the 1933 version where it really, really is left field. She turns her head when Laurie goes off to propose to Joe. So you see that she's a bit interested in him. So that's why in the 1994 version, they are trying harder. They just do it in a really uncomfortable way where the age gap is very obvious. Whereas in the 2017 version, they really don't look that different in age. And then in the 2019 version, they are pushing hard for that romance. And I think it works to an extent. But the thing is, Amy is being pressured by Aunt March to marry well. So you really see that she cares a lot about her family and is very determinedly wanting to marry Fred Vaughan in order to protect her family financially. Whether Laurie is just lazing about, he's really rich. He doesn't have to worry about finance and you don't really get why they should be together because he's not working hard at all, whether she is working very hard. So I think it's much better shown why they should be together in the 2017 version. Laurie is the March's neighbour. He's very rich and he lives with his grandfather in a big house but he's an orphan. His father ran away with an Italian pianist. His grandfather disowned his father and then unfortunately his parents both died. So he's very lonely. He doesn't really have a loving family. He only lives with his grandfather, who's quite strict and overbearing. So he sort of looks through the window at the March sisters in the least creepy way possible and wishes that he was part of their family. So it's really great for him when in the 1933 version, which plays it like the book, Joe sort of calls to him through his window and invites herself over and they become friends in that way and they have lots of fun together because Joe kind of just wants to be like a boy so he can kind of have a good relationship with her as if she were just 
a guy friend. But unfortunately, as they grow up, Teddy, as she calls him, because his name's Theodore, although most people call him Laurie, short for Lawrence, he sort of gets a crush on her and starts romanticising her in his head. So she just sees him as a kind of brother figure, but he gets very overly romantic, especially in the 1949 version. It's quite nauseating. You sort of get why she doesn't want to be with him. Whether it's really, really romanticised in the 1994 version, where they kind of have a meet-cute, she sort of bumps into him at a party, and then they dance together. And it really makes you want them to be together, especially since Amy is a child at that point. So you can't really root for him and her. And I think that's a bit of a problem. And the 1994 version definitely makes you really like Joe and Laurie and kind of ship them. And I think it's much better to kind of show that they are not suited. In the 2017 version, Joe rejects him several times before he makes the proper proposal. So you really know what her answer is going to be and he should have known as well. So I think it's shown much better that she just doesn't feel that way about him. And she is trying desperately to tell him that he shouldn't feel that way about her either. And actually, he's flirting with a lot of other girls, including Amy. So it's kind of obvious that he's in love with the idea of love and not really with Joe. Again, because he's not hardworking, he kind of finds it annoying when he's sitting with Joe in her attic and she's scribbling away and he wants her to come and have fun. But she wants to work on her stories because... It takes a lot of hard graft to complete her novels and her stories in order to get them published. In the 2019 version, it's really strange because Jo actually changes her mind, which she doesn't in the book. You see in that film that she actually writes a letter kind of taking back her rejection of him. And she has to get rid of that letter because she finds out that he and Amy are married. And it's kind of really tragic and you feel bad because you wanted Jo and Laurie to be together but then she rejected him and he went off with Amy. So I think it's just a really awkward and strange way to end it. And they really fluff over the whole thing because it's very unobvious whether she did actually go with Professor Bear because they kind of play it as Louisa May Alcott was forced to end Joe's story with a romance and didn't really want to. She wanted to end with Joe being single like herself. So they try and make it so that Jo is actually writing Little Women. She writes in the love story, but actually in real life, she doesn't. She stays single, which I really dislike. I think they should have been bold and either just made her single or gone along with the usual thing, which is actually in the book where she does marry Professor Bear. So the fact that they go with neither really annoys me. It's actually worse than them doing just the one thing. I do like individual scenes from the 2019 version, like in the 1994 version, Joe and Laurie dancing together is really fun. And also the proposal scene is actually quite good as well, because Laurie's sort of saying how he's given up all these things like smoking and playing billiards with his friends, which Joe doesn't like. And he keeps saying, but it's fine, because I thought you'd love me. And it's just like very obvious that he's changing himself too much for her. He's really not being himself. So he's quite a prankster and immature, and they're just not really suited. Laurie can actually be quite cruel. It's never depicted in any of the versions, but he actually catfishes Meg. He pretends that he's writing love letters from John, so Meg writes letters back, and it's actually really nasty, and Mommy finds out, and it's really embarrassing for Meg, and it's just such a horrible thing to do. It's such a schoolboy thing to do. But at the same time, it really shows that Laurie isn't this great, lovely boy. He can actually be quite horrible sometimes. I've never really liked the bit in the book where he sort of thinks about Mozart, who's one of the composers that he admires, and thinks how Mozart couldn't get one sister, so he marries her younger sister instead. And that's kind of how he thinks about Amy. And I really dislike that because it's kind of like settling. And also, he should like Amy for Amy. He shouldn't just like Amy because then he can be part of the March family. I get why Amy would like him because he saved her from the freezing ice when she fell through skating. But the idea that he just wanted her because he couldn't have Joe is really icky to me. It's really funny in the 2017 version of the proposal because Joe says that she'd kill herself if she thought it would help him. And he goes, how would that help? And she's like, I don't know. 
I think it's much better when they put a bit of humour, they sort of show how much he's struggling because he is generally very hurt when she rejects him, even though it's very obvious that she was going to reject him. It's much better than when it's done sort of overly romantic in the earlier versions. Mami is kind of a mother archetype. She's the matriarch of the March family. She's looking after the girls whilst their father is at war, although they have their servant Hannah. So it's kind of funny they're going on about how poor they are, but they still have a family servant. So they're pretty middle class. They're definitely not lower class. But Mami is kind of the mother archetype, kind of like Atticus Finch is the father archetype in To Kill a Mockingbird. He's kind of the perfect father and she similarly is kind of the perfect mother. Her children adore her and she is always working to help them and to help others. So in the 1933 black and white version, you see her at the start at the soldier's aid where she helps. And in all the versions, she decides that they'll give their family meal at Christmas to the Hummels, a German family who are really, really poorly off. They have so many children and no food to give them. And there's also a lot of illness going on around them. So Mami encourages the girls to give their Christmas meal to the Hummels, which they do willingly, although Amy's a bit reticent about it. And I think in the 1994 version, she takes this much further being a kind of social justice warrior and kind of encouraging her girls to sort of see things from a very certain political point of view, which I think is kind of a bit stressful for Jo. She actually says to Professor Bear that she finds it hard to constantly be asked to be so virtuous and I think having these higher morals and seeing the world as beyond the physical world is sometimes a bit dehumanising for people, especially if your parent is expecting you to live up to these high standards, which are just not possible for human beings. So I think it's much better in the 2017 version where you see that she is human. It's a bit in the book which I really like where she empathises with Joe because she tells Joe that actually she used to have a very hot temper and still does. She still deals with it and Joe's very surprised because she thinks her mother is never angry whether well, actually she realises that sometimes her mother goes out of the room and sort of calms down by herself when she gets angry so that she doesn't take it out on other people and that's the way she kind of deals with her temper. So I think it's really nice and humanising that you actually get to see this portrayed in the 2017 version which is why it's so true to the book because you actually get to see depicted what they're talking about in the book rather than just told and you also see that she does rely on her husband, they're a good team and she is really struggling with not having him around to help look after the girls and bring them up. She's having to deal with it by herself. So when he comes back, it really changes the dynamic of the family. And you see that he is there and can emotionally support both his wife and his daughters. Where in the 1994 version, he's basically a non-character. He kind of stands in the background being useless. And you kind of think that Mami is almost a single mother and she doesn't really need him, to be honest. And then in the 2019 version, Mami seems like a really weak character. She's almost like one of the girls. She doesn't seem to have any control of them whatsoever. They kind of come into Laurie's house and just are chaotic. She can't really get them to sit down and be polite at all. There's a great difference between sort of Joe having a very unconventional personality and having no conception of the manners that they would have had at the time. I think those are two very different things. So I'm not really impressed by the way Mami's portrayed in the 2019 version because she's not the strong character that she definitely is in the book. Thank you for watching my Little Women video. I think Little Women is one of the few books that I don't think needs to be adapted again especially since I like the 2017 version so much. I think that was done perfectly. It's so true to the book. And I'm also very nostalgic about the 1994 version and then would probably watch the 1933 version again just for the interesting cinematography. But otherwise, I think this is one of the few books that has been adapted so many times we really don't need to go through it all again.